Let's look now to the first chapter of John's Gospel. John chapter 1, we're going to begin in verse 29 and read through verse 42 there. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom the Spirit, you see the Spirit descend and remain, is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, Where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Kephas which is translated Peter. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, God, we pray for ears to hear, ears to hear your words, your spirit calling to us, calling us deeper and deeper into a life of faith. We ask God for eyes that see, to behold your presence among us, to notice even the small ways that you move among us. And now, God, we pray for the presence of your Spirit to stir in our midst, to call us, and to show us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. When I was growing up, I'd go into a store with my mama. Maybe you had this experience. Inevitably, somebody would walk up to us and say, uh, can I help y'all with anything? You know what my mama would say every time? Maybe you say it. No, we're just looking. You know what that's code for? No, we can't afford this. <laughs> or no, they don't have this in our size. Or No, we're just looking. People do that a lot. Now, as, a, as an adult, when I say that to someone, if, I, if someone comes up and says, Sir, can I help you find anything? I say, No, I'm just looking. It means, No, I'm just waiting on my wife. <laughs> That's usually what that means. It's funny. There aren't many places where you can just sort of go in and look, but there's one. And this is, they did not pay me for this advertisement this morning, unfortunately. Sally and I, we, we like to, every once in a while, when we have the chance to drive up to Gunnersville. There's a place in Gunnersville we really like to eat. It's called the Rock House Eatery. That's another free advertisement. If you haven't been there, I highly recommend you go. If you go at lunch, get the fish tacos. If you go at night, get the fish tacos. I mean, why go for anything else? But they do have good steak and pizza and stuff. But every time we go up that way, or if we go up towards Huntsville at all, right where 431 winds off there in Gun Gunnersville, there's a place. Doesn't look like much, just a big warehouse with a bunch of cars out in the parking lot, chalk on the windows about how much that car costs, maybe a little piece of paper taped inside. And then all along the outside wall, everything from like 100-foot extension ladders to old bathtubs. It's called Mike's Merchandise. Anybody ever been there? Well, see, a few of us have. The rest of you are not so fortunate and blessed, I suppose. You can get everything you could ever want in that place. You don't have to have an agenda when you go to Mike's Merchandise. We can be driving and say, well, I guess we better stop at Mike's and just walk around. You go inside, there's everything from day glow work hoodies 
to skill saw blades to children's books in English and Spanish. You can get industrial air conditioners, uh, full vanities with the corners knocked off, but they're pretty good. Every bolt and nut you could ever want in your life. Five-gallon buckets of high-efficiency Tide. We bought two of those. One. Everything. You just go in and walk around and look. It's amazing. And nobody, nobody comes up to you and says, can I help you? Because they all know we're all doing the same thing. We're all in there. Just looking. Just looking. I wonder sometimes, now on the second Sunday after Epiphany, we hear a lot about the baptism and that whole thing. I wonder sometimes if John out there by the Jordan wasn't a little bit, just a little bit, like Mike's for some people. Just walking, heading somewhere. Well, I heard, I heard about this guy in camel hair underwear out in the creek, hollering, calling people snakes, and you won't believe this, dunking them under the water. That's what I heard. My Methodist friend told me they're sprinkling him with the water, but that's what he's out there doing. And folks would just sort of casually walk over and come by and see what was happening. I don't know, maybe. Uh, John was doing it more than just once, we know. John, most likely a, a member of that sort of odd group in the first century we call the Essenes, who had these baptismal practices likely connected to the community that, that had originally written down the Dead Sea Scrolls. You've heard of those. So John was probably out in the Jordan practicing pretty regular his call to repentance and baptism. And folks are just coming by. I wonder what that's like. Oh, no, no thanks. We're not here for repentance. Just looking. Just looking. I wonder. You know, in the fourth gospel, that whole phrase is really important. Look. Like Linnell was talking about this morning. If I had done that with you, anytime you read the fourth gospel and you heard look, behold, see, you'd be doing this all the time, <laughs> reading the fourth gospel. It's everywhere. And what's interesting is we sort of hinted at last week in John's sort of telling of the baptism well, there's no baptism. John just sort of says what he saw about Jesus. As he was baptizing with water, he saw this thing happening. And people just come up and talk to John. And it's interesting that at some point, Jesus, first words, he speaks in this gospel. Comes across two of them and says, what are you looking for? It's that strange curiosity, that itch we all have to scratch, to just walk around. What do they got going on in here? What does this look like? What is that all about? It's this unbridled curiosity. It doesn't keep us reserved. It calls us on. It's a gift, I think. A gift of unbridled curiosity that draws us closer to God, to knowing Christ more fully more intimately. It's our curiosity, but it finds its roots, finds its genesis in the testimony of others, whether they speak that testimony or not. Think about it. How many people you know in your life, you're always sort of curious. How in the world are they always so happy? How in the world are they always just so at ease? We all know somebody, right, that's just so, so calm. You just wonder, how are they always just the embodiment of, I don't know, chill? How? We all know somebody like that. Now, we all also know somebody on the other end. How ain't nothing in the world that's going to make that person happy no matter what, right? It's a curiosity we have about someone. It's a testimony they give whether they mean to or not. And you can imagine John's, John the Baptist, his started one way. That crazy, idyllic man out in the wilderness. But wound up another way with him telling people, this is why I'm doing this. He says there in the text that he came, he saw Jesus coming towards him. And he declared, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Why is John able to say that? Well, he says, because when I was out here baptizing, the one who called me to baptize said to me that this one that you see the Spirit coming on is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And in verse 34, he says, I myself have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. And so John forevermore points to Jesus. In fact, if you ever, 
If you ever wonder, uh, it's a bit lost on us Baptists. We, we got too influenced, I think, by the Puritans when we crossed the Atlantic. Uh, we don't know our, uh, um, our, our art very well. But if you ever look on some ancient, or some, uh, not ancient, but some uh, older paintings, there's always some skinny fella with a long finger pointing. That's John. Always John. Pointing. Do you know who he's pointing to? Jesus. Always pointing to Jesus. It's what John becomes known for. John's not the one who the light shines on. He's pointing. Y'all don't look at me. Look at him. It's always John. John's testimony doesn't become about him, but about Jesus. Always, always pointing to Jesus. So I wonder sometimes, when our curiosity is provoked by the way somebody lives, by the testimony they have, what provokes it? Is it how it shines a light on them? How it reflects on them? Look how great I am. Look how calm I am. Look how wonderful I am. Look how wealthy I am. Look how powerful I am. Or are they like John, always pointing to Jesus? Of course, I can't ask that question without asking it to the mirror. When people see me, when people hear me, is it me they hear? Is it me they see? Or am I always like John with one long finger pointing to Jesus? I wonder. Of course, in this life of faith, our curiosity and the curiosity of others is seldom, if ever, meant with a straight answer. It's frustrating, isn't it? I mean, if it was met with a, with a straight answer, we could all just, I could just tell it to you, you can go home, right? You wouldn't have to come back. You'd have it all figured out. Seldom, if ever, met by full, direct, straight answer. It's sort of like when you want to find somewhere to eat, right? My buddy Josh thinks he got around this. He calls it 421. Somebody names four places, then the next person has to name two places, and then there are two of those four, and then somebody has to pick the one. This worked for everyone Josh had ever encountered except for one person. I won't tell you who it is because I'm married to her. Someone picked four places, and rather than just picking two, uh, Sally, and I do this too, maybe you do too. Let me, hold on, hold on, let me look up their menu. Let me, okay, what do they have? What's on that, how much, is, okay, no, what, what's the other place? Let me look, let me see. I'm sure she's not the only one who's ever done that. It's not met with a straight answer. But that's life, right? What, what happens is when our curiosity is provoked and we find our way to something else, well, it's not like that's where it ends. We're curious about that, right? If we're real, if we're truthful, if we're honest. And so what are Jesus' first words in the fourth gospel? Now remember, this gospel starts with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, and all this really great, big language, really wonderful theological, Christological depth. And Jesus' first words in the gospel of John. What do you expect them to be? Repent, for the kingdom is at hand. Uh, this is what it means to be the Son of God. What are Jesus' very first words? In verse 38, When Jesus turned and saw them following, He said to them, What are you looking for? Isn't that odd? John says, Behold the Lamb of God. Right there, direct answer. Plain as day, the Lamb of God. Well, maybe not plain as day. What does it mean to be the Lamb of God anyway? But there it is, the Lamb of God. And they're all saying, well, there it is. There's our answer. And they go to follow Jesus. And what does he say? What are you looking for? I'm afraid to answer that question sometimes. What are you looking for? I love the way Pete Rollins puts it uh, in a book he, he wrote called How Not to Speak About God or the idolatry of God. It's in one of those books. I can't remember now. But Pete Rollins says, if the thing you're looking for is heaven, then you don't really want God. You want heaven. If the thing you're looking for is wealth and peace and security, then that's what you want. You don't really want God. And what 
Christ is calling us to is God. So sometimes I'm afraid to answer that question, what are you looking for? Because I know sometimes, maybe most of the time, maybe all the time if I'm honest, the answer isn't God. But Jesus asks them, what are you looking for? Do you notice, did you notice, by the way, they put him off? They don't want to answer it either. Rabbi, which translated, John says, is teacher. Where you stay at? That's not the answer to the question. What are you looking for? Um, uh, uh, where you live? Where you staying at, Jesus? Uh, you know, do you want to come over? What, what are you doing after this, Jesus? That's not answering the question. It's avoiding it altogether. Why? Because it just provokes more questions. It just provokes more, more, and more. It drives us on. Far too often, I think, we approach faith, maybe even Christ himself, as if it will answer all of our questions. Solve all of our problems. Give us clear, concise answers. Maybe in the form of a Bible verse. Maybe in the form of a bumper sticker that we can slap on the back of our car. But what happens when Bible verses don't answer all of our problems? What happens when things are frankly just far more complicated? What happens when we're not satisfied with the answers we've been given or the answers we think are right? What happens? Curiosity. Our desire to know more should never end when we think we found the magic answer, the right Bible verse, the right whatever. This life of faith is one that calls us ever on, digs us deeper into our curiosity, calls us further and deeper to know and love more. Because as someone once said, the more I know, the more I know I don't know. It's a gift. It's a strange gift. But the gift of curiosity always goes beyond us as we inevitably become those who testify to others whether we want to or not. As a lot of you know, I, I know how to do a thing or two with tools. But a lot of the things or two that I know are the wrong things in the wrong ways. Because I learned from somebody who didn't know how to do them the right way or the right things. My dad, anytime I, I'd look over his shoulder, anytime I was working with him to do something, dad always had the same thing. I, thought, I told him recently, I think I'm going to put this on your headstone, though nobody will know what it means, I don't think. Dad always said to me, do as I say, not as I do. Come on. Does that work? Does that work? Did it work for any of you? I want to know. Does that work? Because I'm going to have to wind up telling Cole that one day, I know. Does it work? No, it doesn't work. Son, put on some safety glasses. Do as I say, not as I do. But daddy, you ain't working. But do as I say, not as I do. Oh, no, don't, use, don't use a cheater pipe on this torque wrench because it's not meant for that, just like I'm doing right now. Please don't do that, son, ever. But daddy, you're, you're, do as I say, not as I do. It doesn't work. And I want to tell you something, friends. It doesn't work when it comes to our faith. It doesn't. John didn't just speak to these curious folks. John was the embodiment of his call. Think about it. You don't get away with wearing camel hair underwear in the first century and people not think you're just a little crazy. You don't get away with calling the religious leaders who come down to the river uh, sons of snakes. You don't get away with that. John didn't get away with it. He lost his head over it. Witnessing testimony is not just about the words we say. It's about the way we live. Do as I say and not as I do. It's why Andrew couldn't help it. It's why Andrew couldn't help but run and tell his big brother. One of the two of them were told, heard John speak and followed him. They had been walking around with John. They knew that John wasn't just some preacher who showed up on the back of a truck with a big tent and several folding chairs, just blowing into town, talking out loud, shouting and slapping his hands together. No, they followed John around. They knew. They witnessed what John was about. And so one of them, Andrew, interesting, isn't it? We're introduced to Andrew, but we're told he's Simon Peter's brother, like we already know who he is. He first found Simon and he said to him, we have found the Messiah. 
We found Him. We found the answer, the anointed one, the Christ. We found Him. Is that all He does though? No, He gets up and He brings Simon to Jesus. And what happened? Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Kephas. I know some folks want to say Cephas, but it's Kephas. It's Hebrew. We can talk about that later. Which is called, it's translated Peter. Kephas is the Hebrew word for rock. Petros, the Greek word for rock. So, you are Kephas. Changed his name. It's not just about, hey, here he is, confess it and say what it is. Peter's name, his life is now changed. Andrew doesn't just hear it, go back to his brother and tell it. He does something about it, gets him up and moves him. When our curiosity calls us to Jesus, we cannot help but express our search, our wonder, our faith to others. We can't keep it in. We don't even have to do it with our mouths. It's my favorite thing Francis of Assisi ever said, or at least was attributed to him. Preach the gospel always. Use words when necessary. People know. People know. You can tell them every single day. You can tell them in every, every language you know. But still, they know. They know. They know the folks they don't even have to tell them. They know. Our curiosity to follow Christ, our desire to know Him more, to follow God more, spills out of us, and people know. They see. And still the question comes from Jesus. What are you looking for? That's the question others are being asked by us without us even knowing it. What are you looking for? Is there something in your life, something about your faith that still causes you to wonder, to scratch your head, to think? Heaven help us if our faith makes us think. Jesus says, as he so often does through the fourth gospel, not, here's the answer, not, well, as it is written in the book of Isaiah, not, as it says in the Psalms, not, here's a theological dissertation. Do you know what Jesus says all throughout the fourth gospel? Three words. Come and see. Come and see. You can't just do that up here. You've got to come and see. You've got to do it. Come and see what it is to follow Jesus. Hard times and all. I guarantee you find a faith that doesn't always provide easy answers. Most of the time I'm going to tell you it doesn't. But you will find a faith that is always calling. A faith that doesn't leave you alone. A God that doesn't leave you alone. A Christ who is always calling. Giving us that gift of unbridled curiosity that pulls us calls us ever on into this life of faith. Jesus still asks, what are you looking for? And whatever answer you have, whether you're afraid to say it aloud or not, Christ's response is still, come and see. Come and see. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, you still call us to come and see. You still ask us, Lord, what are we looking for? Maybe, Lord, we don't even know. But help us this morning to respond to that curiosity you give each of us, that calling, that longing of the Holy Spirit. Call us, Lord, to come and see. Give us the courage, the strength. Lord, give us the chance to do just that. So, Holy Spirit, be with us now. As we listen for your voice, as we listen for your calling, as you ask, what are we looking for? And as you call, as you call us to come and see. In Christ's name we pray, amen.